This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He is chairman of surgery at Nemours Children's Specialty Care, Dr. Richard Reynolds, on this edition of Conversations. Dr. Richard Reynolds specializes in pediatric orthopedic surgery. His areas of expertise include treating bone tumors, scoliosis, and complex hip conditions in children. Dr. Reynolds has a wealth of experience. Prior to joining Nemours in Pensacola, he served as chief of orthopedic surgery at Detroit Medical Center Children's Hospital of Michigan. He has his MD from the University of Saskatchewan College of Medicine in Canada and a master's in healthcare management from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Reynolds is at the forefront of some of today's most advanced and cutting edge surgical procedures. We welcome Dr. Richard Reynolds to this edition of Conversations. Almost cracked up during the intro there just because of the joke you told me about getting a new house every year when you lived in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and tell it. I love it. <laughs> so the common misconception is that in Canada we we have less than modern things that are happening to right. us. So when I tell people that the one of the positive benefits of living in Canada is that we got a new house every year, mm -hmm. usually people stop and look at you and wonder why. So then they ask, well, why? And you tell them, well, in the spring, your igloo melts, <laughs> and then it. you have to build a new one in the fall. Every year, anyway. <laughs> well, welcome to Florida. Thank you. <laughs> so what brought you to Nemours in Pensacola? So multiple things. So the first was uh, working with the Moors, which is a national organization dedicated to working with children. It has a large foundation. And if you look at what we do, we have two hospitals, we have multiple clinics, we have over 400 physicians. Uh, we see uh, about over 300,000 children a year in the Nemours system. So we're kind of like the Mayo Clinic for children. Right. And so that was exciting to work with an organization like that. And then my wife has family here. So up to this point, uh, I've made all the decisions as to where my career was going. And so this was her opportunity to choose where we were gonna go. Great, great. Well, when I first met you, we had an interesting conversation and you were telling me about some of the amazing technology that is going on in pediatric medicine and pediatric surgery. And I said, well, I have to at some point have you on the television show and talk about that. So tell me, let's begin kind of from a 10,000 foot view. Tell me about some of the technology that's happening in pediatric surgery today. So historically, children have been treated with very low technology kinds of methods. So casting, K wires where these are pins that hold fractures together. Uh, and because kids grow and remodel, uh, you didn't have to be as accurate. So you allowed the body to fix some of the mistakes that were allowed to happen. But as technology has advanced, we're using implants that are designed for children mm -hmm. to treat fractures, for instance, much more uh, effectively than we did before. Uh, we're putting bones back where they should be and then we're not having to wait six months or a year for the bones to remodel to become normal. Um, we're also using different kinds of technology that are really cutting edge. So in the past, we have had uh, surgical techniques where we have to lengthen bones or straighten spines where you've had to have subsequent operations to do that. Now we have relatively new technology which uses magnetic motors inside rods, which then by placing a magnet on the patient's skin, we can actually drive that motor to lengthen the rods and make the spine straight or make the limbs longer. So a, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Let's begin with this little device you have here because I guess it allows you to lengthen bones. Sure. Explain it to me. So this is a mock-up. This isn't exactly what it looks like, but you can see that the idea here is we have one rod that fits in another. So with this, you can see how it telescopes inside. 
Now, in the real world, what we do is we put it in in this shortened position. And to allow that rod to lengthen, we put this magnet on top of the skin. Okay. And we turn it on. And so when we do that, the bone gradually lengthens out. And we can determine how much length we get depending on how many minutes we hold it on the skin. So if we want two millimeters, it's two minutes. Wow. And so there's so many revolutions of the magnet to turn the little device inside to lengthen that defined length. Fascinating. Does that cause pain to the patient while that's occurring? So what we're usually talking about increments of a millimeter. So typically it's not too bad, um, but any kind of lengthening of any limb is a really big deal. The blood vessels have to lengthen, the muscles have to lengthen, the nerves have to lengthen. And so the desired rate of lengthening in a, in a lower extremity is about a millimeter a day. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but cumulatively, that can add up to quite a bit. So would the patient just come in every day and you would adjust with the magnet? Is that how that works? Or? For patients that we're doing daily lengthenings, we teach them how to do this. And we actually make the increments of lengthening even shorter. So what we'll do is we'll do a quarter millimeter four times a day. Wow. So they just put it on a mark that we place on the leg where the motor is. They put it on their leg, they turn it on, and it lengthens out the desired amount. That's fascinating. How long has this been in operation? Probably about four years. Um, it's, it's, it's been in Europe for a while. And so there's been some clinical trials that have come out, probably uh, using it for five to eight years. But the Atlantic is what I call the blood-brain barrier. So technology that's on one side of the ocean often takes a while to get across. Why is that? I think uh, it, it's multifactorial. So there's always a little bit of distrust between different countries and what we do. Is it really true? And oftentimes, um, uh, we wait until we have multi-center studies, which are cooperative efforts using multi multiple centers all over the world. And once we have that kind of data, it is usually pretty well uh, accepted, and then we adopt it. It just seems like I, oftentimes I'll hear someone say, we had to go to Europe for this procedure, or I've heard doctors say, well, in Europe they're doing this or that, and it just seems like that we are a little behind in time, at times. The FDA is very strict, and so, and in some cases, that's a good thing. Right. But um, the CE mark, which is in Europe, is often a little faster, and so technology usually comes up first in Europe and then here. What causes a child to be in a situation where they have to have limbs lengthened? Is this just a genetic issue, or, or is it caused by injuries? What? So there are multiple reasons. So the most common is congenital. So there's a congenital malformation where one leg is shorter than the other. That, the most common uh, congenital malformation is called fibular hemiamelia. So the whole leg is shorter, it's smaller, um, and it can be up to 20% shorter than the other leg. So we're talking about inches of difference. Yeah. Uh, it often has associated abnormalities in the joints, too. Uh, trauma, so if you injure a growth plate in a child, it doesn't grow, then what can happen is the limb can go, grow crooked or it can be short. And then, obviously, infections can also do the same thing as trauma does. The infection gets into the growth plate, damages it, so it doesn't grow normally. And, and how... Um prevalent is this in, in the childhood population? It's fairly infrequent. I mean, it's not like fractures, which happen right. every day. But the incidence of uh, hemi uh, fibular hemiamelia is about one in a thousand. So it's not uncommon either. But you, by using these techniques, can get the child back to full speed or pretty close. Yes, so the, the strategies for evening limbs is just like if you have a three-legged stool, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut one off to fit the other two, right. or you can um, lengthen the others. So in, 
so in kids who are growing, we can actually slow one leg down to let the other one catch up, which is a much easier operation. Uh, there's some calculation that goes in how many millimeters a year is that growth plate growing. So we can, we can calculate what kind of differences we can make up. And if the differences are relatively small, uh, less than two inches, then what we can do is use growth and modulate that growth to make them even without having to lengthen the limb. You can actually slow down the growth. Correct. How do you do that? See, I'm giving away all of my secrets. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Right. So, so um, each of the growth plates in the limb grow at different rates. So at the, at the knee, the distal femur grows at six millimeters a year, or sorry, nine millimeters a year. The proximal tibia is six millimeters a year. The uh, distal tibia is at three millimeters a year, and the proximal femur is a two. So if I grow, if I stop one of those growth plates, then that leg will be slowed down in its rate of growth by that number of millimeters per year. So let's say we had three centimeters or 30 millimeters of growth that we had to make up. Mm -hmm. If I stop the distal femur and the proximal tibia, I make up 15 millimeters every year. So I calculate when two years of growth remaining is. I stop the growth plates of the proximal tibia and the distal femur. Two years from now, they'll be even. But how do you stop it? Uh, that's so a couple different ways of actually stopping it. There are little plates with screws on it that actually uh, bracket the growth plate. And so as the growth plate tries to expand, the screws and the little plates stop it. Okay. So it retards that expansion. Uh, and then as soon as you take the little screws out and take the little band off, then it starts growing again. Fascinating. And how long have you been practicing that? So, uh, you know, I'm getting old. <laughs> Join the crowd. <laughs> uh, I've been doing this for over 25 years. So, and I've seen a lot of new technology coming in. And um, it's kind of fascinating to see how some things are evolving, but some things go in cycles. Like what? What's, what's more cyclical? Mm, I think the, the uh, decision to operate for club foot, for instance, right. Uh, used to be um, back in the 50s that nobody did operations on the foot. Um, then uh, in the 60s to probably the 90s, everybody got an operation. And now nobody gets operations again. So we're starting to see, you know, these kinds of cycles come and go. Interesting. Well, let's talk about, you, you have this model here, and one of the things that we want to talk about is, is scoliosis. And let me get you to first explain what scoliosis is. So scoliosis is a condition where your spine is curved. And so if I'm looking at you from the front or the back, the curve goes side to side. Kyphosis is where I look at you from the side and your spine is arched forward. Okay. Lordosis is where I look at you from the side and your back is arched backwards. So that's the major direction. So scoliosis is a curvature where it goes side to side. And as part of that side to side curve, the vertebra also rotate. So particularly in the chest, in the thoracic spine, when that curve goes side to side, the vertebra rotate and then the ribs become asymmetrical. So when you have somebody bend forward, then you see one side of the ribs are higher than the other side of the chest. And so that's, that's how it's picked up in school screening or in your doctor's office. And is there anything that causes uh, scoliosis? Is it just a genetic event? Is it, uh, so the most common is called idiopathic. And that's a fancy term for I don't know. Okay. But we use terms like that so we can charge you more money. Okay. Okay. So if I don't, if I just say I don't know, then what can I really do? Right. Right. Seriously. <laughs> so it's really just so idiopathic know. is by definition an unknown cause. We never really find the reason. 
we suspect that it's multifactorial, that it has some genetic background, may have some other physical um, environmental issues, but it's probably a multi-loci uh, genetic issue that all things come together and you get it. So if someone is initially diagnosed with scoliosis, what would be the first step in starting to treat the problem? So the most important thing is to find out what it is because idiopathic has a certain behavior of that curve. But if it's not idiopathic, if it's secondary to other things, then it has a much different behavior. So it's really important to make that diagnosis. So that's based on age, sex, because girls get idiopathic curvatures eight times more commonly than boys. Hmm. So when boys get scoliosis, we are a little nervous about it as to why it may be happening. So we look uh, for other reasons. Um, so neurogenic things like collections of fluid within the spinal cord like syrinxes or congenital anomalies at the base of the skull called Chiari malformations. These are all types of things that can lead to a much different behavior. So we, we just need to make that diagnosis. Uh, once we do that, then we want to measure it. How big is it? Because the risk of progression is based only on two things. How big is the curve and how much growth you have remaining. So if you're very immature, then you have a much bigger risk because you have many years of growth remaining. So in infantile scoliosis, when <coughs> you're under age three, then your chances of that curve progressing are really quite high. Mm. However, if you're 14 and you have a five degree curve, your chances are nearly zero. Okay. So based on those things, we wanna kind of characterize how much growth you have remaining and how big the curve is. And then we tailor that treatment based on your risk. And if you were at relatively low risk, what would the treatment be? Observation. So if the curve is under 20 degrees <clears throat> and you're kind of intermediate, you've got moderate growth remaining, your chances are only about 20% that the curve is gonna get worse. So we watch it. If, it, the, if oh, the curve oh, does get worse, then we start treatment with a brace. Okay, and then at some point, I guess surgery comes into the mix. Correct. So if the curve gets up over 50 degrees, that's when we start talking about surgery. Now, <clears throat> I know someone that had um, scoliosis and had surgery many years ago with something called Harrington rods. And so I, I understand, I think they were named after the doctor that actually invented the that's correct. rods, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So you, we were talking off air, and you told me that was 1.0 and the, the technology has advanced quite a bit since then. So let me get you to kind of explain what those are and then tell me how things have changed. For sure, so the Harrington rod was really the first idea of how to correct a crooked spine. So essentially it, you take a car jack, you hook it at the top, hook it at the bottom and you jack it up and you stretch out the spine and that makes it straighter. Mm -hmm. So that's what Harrington rods were. Okay. The problem with Harrington rods were the alloys were brittle, so they broke. The amount of force that you put on these rods was quite a bit. So they used to break from between, they used to break the bones mm. uh, where they attached above and below. So then, so to try and fix that problem, they went to uh, different systems. So the Babechko system, which was a double hook. So if one hook isn't good enough, well, why not two? two? Well, they plowed out the same way. And the alloys weren't any different, so they broke two. It wasn't until uh, uh, from Mexico, uh, one of the gentlemen there came up with a system where they had curved rods and they wired every segment to the rod. So they gradually pulled the spine over and so that system actually worked quite well, but it was very labor intensive. Uh, there were lots of um, issues with the, the wires that they used. 
but it was a window into a different way called segmental instrumentation. And so with that, the French with the Cottrell Dubassay systems, they, they all use the same kind of idea, segmental instrumentation. Uh, and so that has evolved, and as all these companies have evolved in their equipment, it's become very similar. So we use different systems to attach devices to the spine using screws, hooks, and cables. And then we use rods that pull the spine into a straightened position using those devices. And then ultimately what keeps the spine straight for the next 80 years is really the bone fusion where all the bones are fused together so that over time the rods really aren't doing anything but it's like rebar and concrete. So if you want to take the metal out, you'd have to chip away all the bone around it. Mm. Similar to your driveway, you'd have to chip out all the cement mm. to get those rebars out. Right. Now, as I understand it, back in the old days, it was a quite brutal surgery. And I understand in today's world, that's not, it's not as bad, is that an accurate assumption? So uh, we definitely do things differently than we did 50 years ago. Um, so to give you an example, uh, blood loss is another big issue. We've got long incision, we leave, lifting big muscles off bone. So there's lots of potential for bleeding. Here in Pensacola over the last couple of years, we've been using new technology to do that dissection. Uh, it's called harmonics. So we're using harmonic scalpels, two different kinds, one for bone and one for muscle. And so we're able to lift the muscle up without really much bleeding at all. So typically, even with the best surgical techniques, 13 level uh, instrumentation and fusion, you'd be looking at two to 300 cc's of blood loss. With this system, we're down to 50. So we can cut bone without bleeding, we can actually dissect the muscle off the bone without bleeding so that the patients wake up, they're not in as much pain, and they don't, um, they get up and move faster, so there's less damage to the muscles. If scoliosis goes untreated, what happens? You get a girl like this. Okay. So uh, her curve progressed to 136 degrees. You can, you can take 136 degrees. Right. So the way we measure that is we take the vertebra that's most tilted at the top of the curve versus the vertebra that's most tilted at the bottom. So 90 degrees, right angle, everybody kind of knows mm -hmm. that. Now add another 45 degrees to that. So that is how crooked the spine is. So the blood vessels, the big blood vessels like the inferior vena cava and the... Um, aorta are all kinked. The liver and the kidneys are, you know, kinked over. The lung can't expand because it's being pressed on by the, the vertebra. So when it gets this big, this is a really big deal. I can imagine. I can imagine. So I have about four minutes left. What are you most excited about from a technological standpoint as things move forward with the pediatric surgery? Well, I think image technology is the thing that's coming down the pipe. With image technology, we're now looking at using images in much different ways than we used to. We're using three-dimensional images. So using this 3D printer, you can get a real idea of how that looks as opposed to just using an X-ray, which is just one view in different planes. So looking at this in three dimensions, and then fusing different image technologies together. So for instance, if we take CT, which is like an X-ray, mm -hmm. but merge that with MRI, which is now taking soft tissue organs and blood vessels, and then even adding things like ultrasound so we can actually see the blood vessels moving in and out, uh, veins and arteries and how that relates. So this whole image fusion technology is coming, and I think that's very exciting. How close are we to that being day-to-day -day practice? Well, I, it's all a matter of money. It's already being used. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the matter of how can we get it into, uh, you know, 
everyday use and, and lots of different clinics. Uh, an EOS machine, uh, which is the 3D imaging, uh, just for the skeleton, you know, you're looking at a couple million dollars. Mm. If you're looking at intraoperative CT scan, you could be looking at, you know, another two or three million dollars. So all this is very expensive technology, but as we all know, the longer the technology's in use, usually prices come down. Mm. Wow, fascinating. What advice would you have to someone who is interested in entering the medical field? If they're a young person about to head off to college. I think the most important thing is, is you need to like what you do. And if you like what you do, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, certainly for uh, healthcare and medicine and specifically in orthopedics, I couldn't think of doing anything else. I, I like it that much. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Any advice to parents as far as um, when you're, you know, making sure your kids are protected playing sports and things of that nature from an orthopedic standpoint? Well, you know those that, that you can buy these big bubbles that mm -hmm. you can put the kid into? <laughs> okay. Short of that, I'm not sure there's anything any parent can do 24 7 to keep their kids from getting into trouble <laughs> what a pleasure talking to you very nice talk to you. enjoyed it very much Great. very best of luck to you Thank fascinating you. discussion did you have any idea there was so much technology that uh, is is coming down the down the highway if you will so quickly um, I hope you enjoyed the program. By the way, you can learn more about what's going on in pediatric medicine at Nemours.org. You can also see more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations. We're also on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take a wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company. And by viewers like you. Thank you.